And I'm speaking now to everybody from down in Florida, up into northern New York, from Seattle, Washington, down to Pasadena, California, and to at least four or five feast sites in Canada. Greetings to all you brethren all over the United States, the South, the North, the Middle West, the Atlantic and the Pacific coasts. This is a wonderful thing. Now we are planning something even bigger for next year, and perhaps a way to reach peace sites in other parts of the world by satellite. The reports I've had is that all of you have been having the best feast ever this year. I'm sure we had the best feast for many years last year. This has been even bigger and better this year. You've been literally, through sermons and through sermonettes, living through the coming thousand years of peace. A time with Jesus Christ here ruling the whole world and all nations. And many of us, hopefully, ruling with him on his throne. A time without any Satan. A time when the earth will be as full of the knowledge of God as the ocean beds are full of water. And the earth has almost none of the knowledge of God today. What a difference that will be. But today, after the Feast of Tabernacles, we have a, a different holy day. Actually, the Feast of Tabernacles ended at sundown last night. And The Feast of Tabernacles is a seven-day festival. Yesterday was the seventh day of the festival, and today is another festival altogether. But as soon as the one ended at the sunset last night, the other began. And so here we still are. And in many ways, we have traditionally regarded this as the great day of the feast. Now, if we try to view the conditions in the world from uh, the point in time of today, where we live today, it's a good deal like going into, or rather, uh, say, tuning in a movie on your television set. And you tune in when it's about uh, three-fourths of the way along. And you don't know what's gone before, you don't know what led up to the place where you are now, and you're bewildered because it doesn't make any sense to you. You don't know what they're talking about or what's, 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 unless you know what went before and what led up to it. So, what led up to our day today, to our kind of world today? Now, the world is different than it was. 2,000 years ago, in many, many, many ways. In some ways it's still the same, unfortunately. Now in John 37, I mean John 7, verses 37 and 38, Jesus Christ stood up and said, In the last day, the great day of the feast. Now, there might be some uh, little problem of discerning exactly whether that meant the day that really followed the Feast of Tabernacles, because they were still all there, just like we are today, or whether that meant the last of the seven days, which would have been yesterday in our time uh, of this feast this year. Anyway, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, uh, 
If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Unfortunately, I have a, a red letter Bible. The words of Christ are in red letters, and I can't read them very well without a magnifying glass. He that believeth on me, said Jesus, the same or, or, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, that is, the Holy Spirit of God, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet, that is, at that time, 1900 years ago, was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now there is a point you should notice. The Holy Spirit had not been given to the Church of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it's called the Congregation of Israel, but congregation is just a, another English word for church. And uh, in one passage in the New Testament, it's called the Church in the Wilderness in the days of Moses. But they did not have the Holy Spirit. And I may say more about that as we go along. The Holy Spirit had not had, had been shut up from mankind until Christ was glorified. Now, there's a lot more to it than that, and I'm coming to a lot more, so just bear that in mind, if you will. Um, the Holy Spirit was not yet at that time given. The Holy Spirit had come up to that time only for prophets. Now, at that time, even the uh, apostles had not yet received the Holy Spirit. In ancient Israel, only the prophets had the Holy Spirit of God. Now, another scripture I want to read right here in connection with this, just a page or two ahead of it, John 6, 40, uh, 6 uh, uh, 44, where Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him. Now, that is a most remarkable statement. He said, no man can, even if he wants to, he's unable, of, unless God the Father draws him. I want you to notice one thing. The initiative must be taken by God. It isn't up to the average man, the man in the street, the man wherever you find him, out on a farm or in the city, to just say, well, I want to come to God. Now, no man can come to God except through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the light, and the truth. But Jesus says no man can come to him unless the Father takes the initiative and draws him through the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will only be used as an instrument in drawing him toward Christ. And the choice has to be God's. Now, that leads us back to something. That's why I say you can't understand the conditions and the things that the Bible says of our time if you don't go back and know what went on way, way before. Why could only those called come to Christ? Now, that has a lot to do with predestination. Yes, there's something about predestination in two different chapters in the New Testament. It has nothing to do with uh, whether you are already predestined to be saved or lost. It has, because we all must make our own decision, it has only to do with the time, with who is called and at what time, the time of being called. To understand, we need to see the panorama of events that led up to the time that we're in now. 
if you're tuning in on a motion picture, we're tuning in on today. But we need to know what led up to today, what led up to this condition. Why do we have the condition in the world we do now? Now, God Almighty is the Creator. Jesus Christ said, I work, and my Father works. They're not lazy, and they're not laying around. But they work. Well, what do they work at? What's their job? Creation. Of course, God is Creator. God is also Revealer of knowledge and truth. He is also the ruler of the universe, and he also is the giver of life. He has life within himself and life to give. Now, God creates in a system or a process of duality. Two and two seem to go together in almost everything God does. For this guy, example, the creation of man is started in a physical uh, creation. So there's the physical creation and then a spiritual creation. Now, the physical creation began about 6,000 years ago in the creation of Adam and Eve, human beings. But the spiritual creation began less than 2,000 years ago in Jesus Christ. And that is the second stage of man's ultimate creation. And that is the stage that is going on now. And that has a lot to do with why we're here right now. And why you, brethren, and the other feast sites all around over the United States and up in Canada are where you are right now. When Adam was created, Satan was right there. He was here on the earth. Now, how did Satan come to be here? Where did he come from? God had created a super archangel whose name was Lucifer long, long before Adam. Well, how long before, we don't know, because the time is not given or revealed. Back in Ezekiel 28:15, I want you to notice something about it. Speaking now of this Lucifer, God says, Thou wast, uh, thou wast perfect in thy ways, in his ways, in the way he acted and lived, the way he fought. Perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. Now, iniquity is lawlessness. Actually, before man was created, God populated this earth with angels. God set over them this great super archangel, Lucifer, the greatest, most powerful being that God ever did, ever can create, just automatically. Apparently, there are two other archangels of equal, uh, equal uh, uh, power today, but uh, he, was, he, he was next to God in power and ability. He was perfect in his ways from the day God created him. God didn't create an evil uh, person, but iniquity was found in him. Now, what do you think is the ultimate thing that God is creating? The ultimate thing God is creating is perfect, righteous character. And that's something that even God himself, alone by himself, cannot create. He created man that character could be built within us, but each of us has to make his own decision. And we have our part in it. And if we decide against it, there's nothing God, God has so willed that there's nothing he can do about it. 
This Lucifer was instructed in all of the government of God. He was set on a throne over the angels, governing and ruling with the government of God. The government of God was set here to carry on this process of developing character within those angels. God had Now, Lucifer had been on the very throne of God. He had been instructed at headquarters of the universe. Just like we have instructed future ministers at Ambassador College. And then after their graduation at headquarters, we send them, as we say, out into the field. Well, now this Lucifer is one that was instructed at headquarters in God's heaven and then sent out into the field, this earth. And he had been instructed in the government of God. And the government of God is merely the government to uh, lead into the right way of life. Now then again, we get down to a philosophy of life. And as I have said to the leaders of many nations, to kings and emperors, prime ministers, there are two ways of life, or, if you please, two philosophies, only two general ways. And I put it in language that a five- or six-year-old child ought to understand. The one way is the way of give, and the other is the way of get. Now, the way of give is really the way of love, because love is not lust. Love means an outgoing love, an outgoing concern for the good and welfare of others. It is the way of wanting to serve and help and cooperate, the wanting to share with others, of having at your mind and heart only the good of others. But getting is that I want to get off for me. I don't care about anybody else. I'm looking out for number one. Why do I care what happens to anybody else? Now, the government of God is based on a law. You don't know any government anywhere that is not based on a basic law or constitution of some kind. Right here in the city of Tucson, Arizona, where I am just now, we have a local city government, and it's based on ordinances and laws. The state of Arizona is based on certain state statutes and laws and a state government. And it has to, and is supposed to conform uh, to many, in many ways, to the government of the United States over all states. And the United States is founded on the Constitution of the United States. And we're in the process right now of testing whether that Constitution, the law of this land, can even stand. And whether Christ is going to be able to lead his church or whether the politicians can. And as Mr. Rader has been explaining to you, if the state of California can win this battle against the worldwide Church of God, then they will go after other churches. And if the state of California can do it, then other states will begin to do it until all churches will be wiped out. They have been in Russia. Don't say it could never happen here. It is just that serious, as Mr. Rader said. Let, let nobody be misled or misunderstand that point. Now, this world has really been ruled by Satan, and I'm coming to explain that right now. And, of course, the real instigator of it is Satan. But Satan has uh, deceived the entire world, and many people are doing things of which Satan is the real instigator, but they're unaware of that. 
They don't realize they were really led into it by an evil Satan. Well, iniquity was found in this Lucifer. He led all of his angels into rebellion against the government of God, and the government of God no longer was administered on the earth. And his physical destruction came to the earth as a result of that. But in the 104th Psalm, it's in verse 30, it speaks about God renewing the face of the earth by sending forth his Holy Spirit. And so, you find the earth in a state of chaos and destruction in the second verse of Genesis 1, the first chapter of Genesis. And the Spirit of God is there brooding, brooding over the watery surface. It was all ocean. There was no land at that time. And it was all dark because the sin of the angels brought darkness. And God is the God of light and not of darkness. So the first thing that God did, he said, let there be light. And so light appeared. And then in six days, he renewed the face of the earth for mankind. Angels had failed. And you read in Peter, in Second Peter, in the second chapter and fourth verse in the New Testament, of how the angels sinned, and God has not spared them who sinned. And so we're told, fear not, lest he uh, will not spare us. Now, Lucifer had his name changed to Satan, and we know him as Satan today. He has deceived the whole world. Well, God first created man, and he created a woman from the man. Adam and Eve, they were called. Just as God had instructed Lucifer at the headquarters of the universe, Lucifer was on the very throne of God before he sent him out. So God first instructed Adam, and he talked with Adam that very first Sabbath day. And God did not allow Satan to have any contact with Adam until God had thoroughly instructed him about the government of God, about the coming kingdom of God, which is the family of God ruling with the government of God, a different thing than the government of God. And he had, he had shown him that God's way and God's government is based on love, on the way of give, and not on the way of get. Just to use my own phraseology for it. Now, Adam had an opportunity to qualify to replace the former Lucifer on the throne of the world and to, uh, to administer the government of God. Now God was determined to restore the government of God to this earth, and he intended to do it through man. Now the first man, Adam, was given a chance. But just as Lucifer had rejected and rebelled, so now did the first man rebel. There were the two trees in the Garden of Eden. One was the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. That was taking to yourself the decision of what you think is right and what you think is wrong. The way of a man that God says is never right and leads to death. Then there was the tree of life, which represented the Holy Spirit and the gift of eternal life, which God was willing to give Adam free. He didn't have to repent. He had never done any sinning yet at the time God spoke to him. But Adam had to uh, qualify by rejecting Satan and Satan's way, the get way, 
and by accepting God as his ruler, as the revealer of knowledge and truth, and as Savior, so he had to also not only reject Satan and Satan's way, but obey God and accept God's way. As I say, that this uh, was symbolized by the two trees. Now, Satan, when he was allowed to, Satan got through to Adam by way of his wife. And Satan has gotten through to many men through their wives. Let that be a warning to you husbands and you wives. Eve finally tried the first scientific experiment in this world. I wonder if you realize that the tools of science, of modern science, first, number one, is the rejection of revelation from God as the source of knowledge. They will not receive knowledge from God. Number two, observation and measurement. Number three, uh, experiment. Number four, human reason. So Eve rejected what God had said about that she would uh, surely die if she took of that tree. She looked at it and had observation and reason. It looked desirable, good for fruit, it was beautiful. She couldn't see anything wrong with it, and she wasn't about to believe God when he said it was wrong. She was going to discern, determine that for herself. So she used human reason, and then she decided to make an experiment. She took of the tree to see what would happen. Result of that first scientific experiment, she and her husband died, and they're not living today. That was the first scientific experiment. Now then, let's go back to Genesis, the third chapter, and at the very end of the third chapter. And the eternal God said, Behold, the man has become what was one of us to know good and evil. That is, he took to himself the knowledge of good and evil instead of letting God give it to him. God is the revealer of knowledge. And if you shut off revelation, you shut off the real source of knowledge. And now lest he put forth his hand and take of the tree of life, which he had not taken yet, and live forever. Because that represented the Holy Spirit, the tree of life. And lest he do that, therefore the eternal God said, uh, sent him forth from uh, the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man. And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim with a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. God then shut mankind off from the Holy Spirit. And God, in effect, said to Adam, to put it in modern language, my own language, he said, Adam, you have made the decision. You have had the chance to make a great decision, not only for yourself, but all of that will be born from you, which will be the entire world of humanity. You have decided for yourself and all of them. Therefore, I sentence you and your progeny, mankind, to 6,000 years of being completely cut off from me all except the few that I shall specially call and draw to me, 
for special service or activity preparing for the kingdom of God when I will reestablish the government of God on this earth and with the kingdom of God, the government of God. You know, the only place on, the, on earth today where the government of God is being administered is in this church, the worldwide church of God. Now, our present world headquarters are uh, in Pasadena, California. At least they have been. And right now, I've sort of moved them of myself over here to uh, Tucson, Arizona, as I think most all of you know. And so, the largest state in the Union had decided to attack and to try to do away with the government of God. They men there don't know that. They have been moved by Satan, but Satan is the great deceiver. And they don't know what led them. They're looking at it from a human political point of view. But the whole object is to destroy the government of God. But fortunately, God previously moved me over here in, into Tucson, Arizona. And had he not done that, number one, when I had complete total heart failure, uh, let's see, I guess that's over two years ago now, I probably would never have come back because I was utterly dead for a certain small, short length of time. It might have been 30 seconds, it might have been a minute and a half or more, because no one was clocking it at the time, to be sure. Anyway, my heart had completely stopped. There was no heartbeat. There was no... Uh, uh, blood pressure, there was no pulse, there was no breath, I was not breathing. And my fingernail turned to whatever they do turn to under those conditions. My face was, I think, all blanched and everything of the kind, but they, by mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth resuscitation they brought me back. Secondly, if I had been in California on January 3rd of this year, I don't know whether the state's attack might have succeeded or not. Fortunately, I was here, and I was able to send letters to all of you brethren all over the United States. The first letter I had mailed from Pasadena, and the state's agent stopped it at the post office from going out. They weren't even going to let me communicate with you. So I sent another letter, and it wasn't mailed in Pasadena. And the response was overwhelming. And so now you send the tithes and offerings to me personally here. But I am incorporated in the corporation's soul as custodian for the Church of God. So in a sense, that makes the headquarters here, doesn't it, now? But of course, our properties are still in California, and we're going to protect them. You can believe that. The state wants that some $80 million worth of beautiful property, the most beautiful campus in the United States or in the world, and they want to stamp out the church. Because to run it would be ridiculous. They wouldn't know how. They wouldn't know the first thing about it. Now, God had cut man off. He said, go form your own governments. He said, go form your own religions. You rejected me as your God. All right, look at all the different religions that man has formed under the sway of Satan. God said, you go form your own 
uh, fun of knowledge, since you reject knowledge from me. So man has done that. In man's store of knowledge, he's built his institutions of learning. And our educational system is all what man has done under the supervision and guidance of Satan the devil. And he, mankind doesn't even know that. And I say to you today that the most ignorant men we have in this world are the most highly educated, because they've been educated in so many fables and so many non-truths that they're going to have to unlearn those before they can ever begin to learn real truth. And so man has gone out to form his own institutions, his own governments, his own churches, his own uh, knowledge, his own civilization. Now, uh, for 6,000 years, man has been cut off from God in a way that man does not realize. Again, as Jesus Christ said, no man could come to him unless the Father would draw him. God must take the initiative. No man, no man is able to do that. But man has not been cut off from Satan. I want to emphasize that point. Now, for 5,700 years, man had stumbled along about the same old keel in this sense. So far as what human beings call progress, there has been very little progress in 5,700 years of man's development on earth. For example, in travel, Man originally had to walk, go horseback or muleback, or uh, a, a rowboat or a sailboat. And that's why most cities were built uh, on a harbor on the seashore, on the sea coast. It's only in the recent years that man has begun to come out of it and make what humans call progress. Now, I have to put word, uh, quotes around that word progress, word progress. However, the modern progress, so-called, started with the pr invention of the printing press. See, what is that about 400 years ago? But it took some time after the invention of the printing press before knowledge could be, a man's knowledge, could be uh, disseminated and spread. At first they had to teach teachers before they had teachers to teach others. And so the so-called progress was slow even at that for a long time, but it gained momentum as it went along. Now most so-called progress has come in this century since I've been here. Now, this thing of man calls progress, it's dual, or uh, what God would call progress. There are two kinds. One <clears throat> is physical and material progress, and the other is spiritual. Now, the physical progress that man has made, much of that is very good, and some of it is very bad. Spiritual progress has been in reverse going backward, not progress at all, but backsliding. Physical progress, well, when I was born, before the beginning of this century, we had in the cities horse-drawn little dinky streetcars with a team of horses pulling them. And the first kind of a streetcar I can remember is when I was about five years old, and they had what we call the little dinkies, the first little tiny electric cars uh, with, with a trolley on an electric line. 
No one ever thought of flying in the air until I was 11 years old, when I believe it was Orville Wright who made the first flight about as far as across this auditorium right here, and not out of the sight of anybody, when I was 11 years old. Telephone was still in its infancy. Communication and transportation were still elementary in every way. In the United States, we were primarily an agricultural country at that time, with the overwhelming majority of our population living in, on farms or in the smaller towns. Today it's just the reverse. But at that time, agriculture was not mechanized. In other words, they had horse-drawn plows, and my, how I have seen that, and farmers plowing out by the roadside in the country in Iowa, singing at the top of their lungs as they worked all day. They were happy then, not anymore. I have seen develop the machine age, the age of science and technology, you might call it the air age, the automobile age and its rapid transportation and air age, the nuclear age, and now the space age. Now, today, the number one question in the world is the question of human survival. Because now science and technology have developed the weapons of mass destruction that can erase all human life from off this earth. And if God doesn't intervene, it would be done. But God will intervene before that happens, and it won't be done. Now, that's the physical progress. Let's look at the spiritual progress or retrogression. Retrogression. Anything like spiritual progress has been going backward in almost exactly the ratio that the physical progress has been going forward. As science and technology have developed and advanced, Morals and spiritual progress has waned and gone backward just as rapidly. You ever think of that before? When I was a boy, we didn't have any such problem as divorce and remarriage. I never thought about divorce. There had never been a divorce in any of my family. None of my aunts or uncles or cousins or anybody that I knew in the family. Marriage was for life. And when I married, it was for life. And it lasted 50 years until my wife died. And now God has provided me with another wife. And that's according to God's own plan. Now, the very foundation of human civilization is the family unit. The family unit has been broken. Families are breaking up today. Divorce now is rampant. About every third marriage ends in divorce, and in some places even uh, more than that. Morals have been on a toboggan slide. Crime and violence have just increased and been rampant. Wars were increasing with greater means of mass destruction until now. The next war, if it's a nuclear war, can erase all humanity from this earth. And that is the number one problem on earth today. In other words, what we have had is human degeneration. Now measure that against the advancements of science and technology. All of the benefits of science and technology are no good with degeneration. They're, they're of no benefit to us whatsoever. 
And yet science and technology have brought us the weapons that will finally destroy us in cosmicide. We have come to the place where only Jesus Christ can save this world alive. And of course we know he's going to do it, and the first thousand years of his reigning on the earth as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is what we've been celebrating here the last seven days, and what all of you brethren all over the United States have been celebrating in your various uh, uh, places. Now, in the meantime, God has been calling some, and he has called only those that he was going to use in uh, the uh, development of the restoration of his government on earth and the, and the formation of the kingdom of God, which is the born family of God administering the government of God. God called them to reveal the knowledge to them, to make them his government, and see if, if they would obey him in his government. Now, he gave them statutes and judgments to be the national uh, uh, laws of their government. He gave them his great overall spiritual law of love, which is uh, defined down into the Ten Commandments, it's love toward God and love toward neighbor. Then, in addition, he gave them a ritualistic law. Now, that is a physical law, not a spiritual law. It was a, a law of uh, physical rituals to do morning, noon, and night to teach them the habit of obedience because he did not give them the Holy Spirit. He gave them this, uh, this uh, physical ritual law as a substitute until the Holy Spirit came. But a substitute didn't do the job, a physical law. And he also gave them a law of animal sacrifices because Christ had not yet come. Now, the sacrifices could not forgive sin of animal sacrifices, but they were a reminder of sin. <clears throat> Let's see. I almost lost my place here in my notes. Now then, we come down to our time now. Christ came and preached the good news of the kingdom of God, the restoration of the government of God on this earth. That's the most important thing to God right now, in a sense, because that is the basis of developing character and for God's ultimate overall purpose for the whole universe, which very few know or understand, and I read to you how Christ said, let him who's first come to me and drink, that the Holy Spirit would come to them, but the Holy Spirit had not yet at that time been given yet, because Christ had not yet been glorified. Now that's why ancient Israel had animal sacrifices as a substitute to remind them that Christ would come, although their animal sacrifices didn't forgive their sins. Now God had called some. The Father did uh, 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 call some to Christ. Jesus said no man could come to him unless the Father uh, uh, drew them, and God did begin to draw some. Uh, Peter, only 120 had been drawn for the whole three and a half years of Jesus Christ's ministry. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and entered into that 120. But there were many others there from all the nations around the earth. And Peter preached a sermon. And they were convicted because they realized 
especially those who had been in Judea at the time, that they were the ones who had uh, killed the very Savior, Jesus Christ, or had caused it. They said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So about 3,000 were converted. Now, they were those that God had drawn. But the other people uh, in other places outside had not been drawn and were not converted then. There was one time that God wanted the Apostle Paul to go to a certain place. For he said, I have many people there. In other words, God was going to draw many people there. Jesus said to Peter and others of the apostles, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Because they were fishermen fishing in uh, the uh, Sea of Galilee. I've been all around it. I haven't tried to walk on the water, as Peter did yet, and I think I won't do that right away. But um, Peter said, I will make you fishers of men. Well, now, when you go fishing, you may let your fishing uh, rod or, 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 or the fish hook down into the water and maybe you can stand there all day and never get a fish. At another time or another place, you let it down and you get fish just one after another as fast as you can pull them out. Because they run in schools, and you never know where the fish are, and you don't know what fish you're going to get. You can't pick out and say, I want to get that one, and think that that one's going to uh, take the hook and you're going to pull him out. Well, that's the way it is with men. I know when I was first converted, I wanted to see all of my family and relatives converted. And so I tried to talk them into it. And they just thought I was crazy. Any of you ever have that experience? No man can come to Christ unless the Spirit of the Father draws it. And God the Father had not drawn those people. I couldn't help that. That was not my doing. Now, let me tell you something else. It begins to explain something else a little farther. Over here in 1 Peter, 4th chapter and verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. In other words, we are the house of God, brethren. Just as the church that was uh, first started and converted on that day of Pentecost in 31 A.D., judgment was on them. They were then being judged. We're part of that same church today in our generation, and we are being judged. Now, here's the point I want you to get. No man can come to Christ. God has cut others off from him. People think that it's man that cut God off. Oh, no. God cut man off. Now, does that seem fair? A lot of people say, well, that's not fair then. God didn't give them any chance of conversion. That's true. He didn't. He didn't give them any chance of salvation. Well, now, the human reason would say, well, well then God's not fair. Why does he give some a chance and others not? There's no partiality with God, brethren, let me tell you that. The reason God has drawn some, I said, that he only draws those he's drawing to have a part in preparing for the kingdom of God. He's not drawing them just to get them saved. Everyone is going to be drawn to salvation in the end. Well, what about all these millions and billions that have lived and died and never have been drawn, and they were cut off from God, and God cut them off, and they never had a chance? Oh, well, God's going to take care of that, too. 
And that's what I'm here to explain to you right now. That's what this day is all about. And the world doesn't understand it. Now let's go on from there. Judgment is on us, but we're only the first fruits. We're represented by the day of Pentecost in our annual holy days, just the first uh, harvest. But we who are called now have to overcome this world, ourselves, and Satan. Now let me tell you something. The others that God has not called, he just hasn't called them yet. And when he does call them, they won't have to overcome any Satan. They won't have to. We've got a lot tougher time than they will have. On the other hand, we are going to be rewarded according to our works, and those of us that do overcome Satan are going to rule with Christ in his throne. Jesus had to qualify to sit on that throne. He had to overcome Satan who had been sat on that throne when he was the archangel Lucifer. Jesus had to overcome Satan. He had to reject Satan's way, and he did. If we're to sit with him on his throne, do you think we can get on there without qualifying also? Well, you better think again. If we're going to rule with Christ, we have to overcome Satan the same as he did. Now, those that God has not called, he hasn't called yet. But when he does, there won't be any Satan around. And they'll have so much an easier time of it. <clears throat> There's no impartiality with God. Absolutely not. But we can have a greater reward, although we have a tougher time getting to it. Now, those that have been cut off from God, that could not come to him unless God would draw them, have not yet been judged. Now. Their works have been recorded. Whatever they have done, they're still going to be judged for it. But they're also going to get, be given a chance to repent and be forgiven for it when their time of, of judgment comes. There are a number of judgments mentioned in the Bible. I don't have time to go into all of those just now. I tell you that there's only one church on earth today that understands God's master plan. His master plan is unfolded and given to us through these seven annual holy days and the seven annual festivals, and this is the only church on earth that observes them. God revealed that to me 52 and a half, or 52, no, 52 and a half years ago. And at that time, my wife and I began observing these annual holy days. We didn't yet understand all of the festivals. We didn't understand why. We just knew God said do it. And we found it was binding forever and uh, that it was also observed by Christ and by the church in the beginning, uh, the New Testament church. Now, I preach it to others that were supposed to be even the church of God. They laughed me to scorn. They would not accept it. For seven years, my wife and I had to keep these holy days alone by ourselves. Then the beginning of this church was raised up in autumn of 1933. They were my own converts. I taught them these annual holy days, and they began to keep them, starting with 19 members. And that's the way this church now scattered all over the world, and that's when we started. Now, for seven years, we kept these annual holy days, or Sabbath days, and we didn't really understand why we were doing it. But all the brethren and the church started to grow now, and the radio broadcast was going, the plain truth was being published and starting, very small. 
just growing gradually, little by little, and yet it was growing at 30 percent a year on the, on, on, the, on the average. Then after seven years of that, now 14 years from the time that we had begun, God revealed to me why we are to observe these days and festivals, and that they picture God's great master plan for the redemption of humankind. And I saw that we should get out and keep the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days as a type of the kingdom of God to get away from the, uh, from the world as a whole. And so then I went out and found a fine little place in Belknap Springs up in Oregon. Well, you know, even my own church members that have been my own converts, most of them would not observe anything more than just the annual Sabbath. They weren't going to accept anything new they didn't already have. But from then on, all new converts did. And that's the way it is. Why is it so many, they go just so far and they won't go any farther? They can't receive any new knowledge. Well, look how many we have now keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. Almost 100,000 of you listening to me right now all over the United States and Canada. It's a marvelous thing. And I don't know of any other body on earth that is doing it, but God revealed it to me, and it had to start with my wife and myself alone, and we did it. So I've been keeping these things a lot longer than you have, as I'm sure you all know. Now, as you know, the Passover is to picture to us the sacrifice of Christ, the Lamb of God slain for uh, uh, paying the price of our sins, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days uh, pictures our coming out of sin or putting of leaven out of our homes, the, the, the putting of sin out of our lives. The Feast of First Fruits or Pentecost is the picture to us that we are only the first fruits that God is not trying to save the whole world now. This is not the time when God's trying to save the world. This is the time God has cut the world off and they can't be saved. Now I say, does that mean injustice with God? No, it's God's responsibility and He will see to it. And they're going to have a better chance than we. It's just a case of deciding when the time comes. The first of the fall, uh, fall festivals, beginning the first day of God's sacred seventh month, the Feast of Trumpets, picturing the second coming of Christ. Now, we're looking forward to that now. That can't come within one or two years because other things have to happen. But it could come within, oh, say five, six, seven years. It could. I don't say it will. Then the Day of Atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month, primarily that picture is putting our sins that Christ has taken and paid the price for us, but Christ is not paying the price for Satan. And the real author of our sins is Satan. And the, the, the Satan is going to have to bear that himself. And Christ is going to put it on him. And then he's going to be taken away. Then we come to the Feast of Tabernacles, the sixth festival, which ended last night. That pictures the millennium, the thousand years reign with Christ. Now then, you've been learning all through the last seven days that then all who are left alive on earth will be ruled under Christ and under those of us that are converted. And I'm afraid many who profess to be will find that the door is shut and they can rap on the door, but Christ will say, I never knew you. You better read the 25th chapter of Matthew, beginning with verse 1 again about the ten virgins. You know, there's some say that I believe in 
uh, being an individual Christian and just uh, worshiping Christ on my own. But Christ formed a church, and he formed a church with a job to do and a body. And if I had to leave that body, I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for my chance of salvation. However, I haven't time to explain all of that now. But all who are still living when Christ comes are then going to be called and drawn to Christ by Almighty God the Father. Now that's when he begins to save the world. But Satan will be taken away. There won't be any Satan around. The kingdom of God will be ruling. Those of us who have been converted and who have the Holy Spirit and are being led by the Holy Spirit of God, if we have died between now and then, we will be resurrected. Not as human beings, but immortal. And we will rise to meet Christ in the air. We will then be as God, composed of spirit, not flesh and blood any longer. Immortal, not mortal. Those of us who were living at that time, and I still say I could be, if God so wills, will then be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and rise with them in the air to meet Christ as he's coming back to earth. He's not coming to meet us as we take off for heaven. We're going up to meet him in the clouds as he's coming back here. And he's going to be here. And his feet are going to stand that very same day on the Mount of Olives. And where he is, we're going to be also with him. Now, a lot of churches get that mixed up. Now then, what of the billions and billions of people that could not come to Christ, could not come to God, that were cut off from God, no chance of salvation at all from the time of Adam on? What about all of them? God's responsible for them. That's God's responsibility, and there can be no unfairness with God. Some people would say, well, it doesn't look like God's fair. He lets us be called now and not a lot of others. No, that's poppycock. God is fair with everybody. Let's go to the 20th chapter of Revelation. And uh, beginning with uh, verse 11. Now, you find in the beginning is how Satan is taken away. And then there's the, uh, the first resurrection and the people reigning with Christ a thousand years. And we've been uh, observing that, and you've had sermons about it for the last seven days. But now let's begin with uh, 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 verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. Now this is after the thousand years is over. And uh, John in his vision saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books according to their works. Now there was the book of life. That shows that many are going to be saved and there will be no devil around at that time. The devil will appear just briefly after the thousand years, and then he'll be put away again before this happens. Now, ancient Israel had no salvation except their prophets. I mean spiritual salvation. Let's turn now, if you will, back to uh, Ezekiel 37. To Ezekiel 37. Oh, here I was. Didn't know it. 
and uh, I'll read the whole first 14 verses. This is about ancient Israel, who was not given the Holy Spirit of God. The hand, the hand of the Lord was upon me, that's the prophet Ezekiel, and carried me in the Spirit of the Lord, and sent me down to the midst of the valley which, is, uh, f uh, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them uh, round about. And behold, there were very many in the uh, open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? Now they're dead, they're skeletons, they're bones. Can a skeleton live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. At least he knew God knew. And he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the, Eter the Lord Eternal unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live, these skeletons, these bones. And I, now these bones are, I'll show you later, the whole house of Israel. Now I heard a sermon preached on this by a very famous woman evangelist one time, and uh, uh, she said, these dry bones are all of the other churches in the world, but uh, uh, we're not the dry bones, we've got life in us. Well, uh, you see, if she had just read it right here, it tells you who the dry bones are. And I will lay sinews upon you on these bones, and I will bring, you, uh, bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. Now that... Uh, breath is, is, is what we have to have for physical life. In immortal life, spirit life, we won't need any, any, any breath. So this is speaking of uh, bringing people back to uh, human life just like we are now. It's not speaking of an immortal uh, uh, or, or a resurrection to immortality. And you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord, the Eternal. <clears throat> and I prophesied as uh, uh, I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld... Lo, the sinews, and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, and but there was no breath in them. So naturally, this is talking human life, and so they, they still didn't have life in them. And then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, or air, Prophesy, son of man, and say unto the wind, thus says the Lord Eternal, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied, as he had commanded me, and uh, the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet as... Uh, an exceeding great, uh, great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They're not the church of the lady preacher. These bones are the whole house of Israel. That is the ancient Israel prior to the time of Christ. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost, we're cut off from our parts, because they never received the Holy Spirit, and they never received salvation, and they didn't understand that they still could receive it. Now here is a resurrection at the end of the thousand years. Therefore, 
prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord Eternal, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves. Now this is Israel. And cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Eternal. And when I have opened your graves, O my people, you see, they never did really understand it. They committed adultery. They were supposed to be married to, 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 to uh, well, we know it was the one who became Christ, but to God. And uh, uh, they never really knew that he was really the Lord or the Eternal. And I brought you up out of your graves. And uh, uh, shall put my spirit into you. Now, when he brings them up, get this point. First he puts breath in them. And now they're going to come after they have that breath to know God. Now God's going to draw them to him. And shall put my spirit in you. Now that's when they're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Eternal, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Eternal. Isn't that a wonderful teaching? Isn't that wonderful, the ways of God? Now, not only Israel, but all nations are going to come into such a resurrection. Let's turn now to Matthew 12, beginning with verse 41. Matthew 12. Verse 41. The men of Jesus is speaking, and he said, The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment. Now, speaking about a judgment, the great white throne judgment after the millennium, the men of Nineveh shall rise up, that's a resurrection from the dead, in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and uh, uh, behold, a greater than Jonah is here. And he was talking to the scribes and Pharisees, and uh, he is much greater than Jonah, but they wouldn't believe him. He says, now the queen of the south shall uh, uh, rise up in judgment with this generation and shall uh, uh, condemn it, and that's a Gentile nation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the world, or of the earth, to uh, hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So they're going to be in this judgment too, in the resurrection. Now then, another very important one is Luke, the 31st chapter. And, uh, uh, or the 11th chapter, Luke, 31, Luke 11, verse 31. Luke 11, verses 31 and 32. And again, is Jesus speaking. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment, that's in the great white throne judgment, in a resurrection, and condemn them, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for they repented uh, at the preaching of uh, Jonas, and a greater than Jonas is here. Now, wait a minute. Also, he spoke about, uh, it'll be in this judgment, I, I, I guess I didn't get that scripture down, but uh, uh, the men of Sodom and Gomorrah will fare better in that judgment than these that were rejecting the very Christ himself when he was on earth 1900 years ago. And it shows 
that there will be a resurrection of all of those that God had cut off from him. Brethren, can you get this into your mind? We've always assumed that God is trying to save the whole world. All Protestants believe that. And I suppose all Catholics in their way. God has cut the world off, except those that the Father calls. But there is this, this judgment coming, and they're going to have it easier than we do when their time comes. Let's understand that. All shall have been called. It is only, uh, uh, only the church and the prophets have to overcome Satan. And we're going to rule with Christ. We have a chance at a greater reward, but we pay a bigger price to get it to, let me tell you. Now then, in closing, finally, will you turn to uh, uh, Romans 11, beginning with verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, these judgments of his that I've been telling. Judgments on us now. It'll be on those who are alive in the millennium. It'll be on everybody else that never had been judged before after that in the great white throne judgment. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? And who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and, he, uh, and uh, it shall uh, be recompensed uh, unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things in whom glory forever. Amen. And with that, brethren, we come to the end of this eight-day festival. It's been here in Tucson, Arizona, the most wonderful festival that I know of. And I, from reports from other, other, other feast sites, I think it has been there, too. And I hope that all of you listening have had the most wonderful festival ever. Now we're beginning greater plans for uh, the festival next year immediately. And there are some that will be working all year on it. That we'll come back to still greater feast next year. And we're looking forward now to that great time, the millennium, when there'll be no Satan. And then after that, when all that have been cut off by God and from God will then be called and they won't have any Satan to confront them. What a wonderful time that will be. So now carry this thought and the wonders of God as you go home. And I hope that and we we'll pray that God will send angels along to see uh, that you have no automobile accidents of any kind. Drive carefully. Keep your eye on the ball, and that's right ahead on the, the road where you're going, and at both sides and intersections. And I hope that you all get home safe and sound, and hope to see you next year, and I hope to see all of you. Now, some of you, of you have not had the picture this time. Most of you have. Next year, we hope that we can have it so that you can all uh, uh, see the festival from here, just the same as most of you have this year. So with that, I'll say goodbye to all of you for now until next year. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.